Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Collision Vision, driven by Auto Body News. As always, I'm your host, Cole Strandberg. Today's episode marks the final episode of our inaugural series, one focused on technology within collision repair. We've discussed software, ADAS, new technologies, and today we're going to dive deeply into the world of EV repair. We have two all-stars on today's show, each coming from a unique perspective within the industry. Kelly Logan, a return guest here on the Collision Vision, is the Director of Collision Repair Programs at Rivian, and Chris Burton is the owner of Roslyn Auto Body, an OEM certification-centric collision center out of the Alexandria, Virginia area, and a board member with SCRS. We're going to spend much of today's conversation around how exactly body shops can take full advantage of the opportunities EV repair creates, both from the perspective of an OE and from a shop that's doing it. Enjoy the show. Kelly Logan and Chris Burton, thank you both so much for joining us here on The Collision Vision. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thank you. Looking forward to a great conversation. I heard a cat in the background. That's perfect. Mine is not around, <laughs> so we're missing our, our local uh, resident cat. But want to dive right in. Kelly, you've been on the show before, but uh, remind us a little bit. Tell us about your role at Rivian and how you became involved in the collision repair program, especially within the EV world. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Cole. Yeah, so uh, since I uh, talked to you last time, I actually, uh, my, my title just recently changed. Uh, I'm director of uh, 3P service and collision programs. So I'm responsible for Rivian certified collision network. Um, we currently have um, three different programs through that network, um, the certified collision centers to, for fixing our R1 vehicles, uh, our fleet centers for fixing um, our, our commercial vans uh, that Amazon utilize. And then we also have a calibration network now um, that uh, we go out and recruit um, businesses that are doing specializing in calibrations. Um, recently, just started um, to launch Rivian's authorized service provider program. So now we're going out and working with third party uh, independent service providers. So looking for uh, folks that are interested in helping us work on our um our commercial van fleet out there for Amazon. And also we are going to be expanding, selling our vans to uh, anyone and everyone. So uh, it's kind of exciting times, definitely a new challenge for myself. Um, been in the EV world for off and on for 12 years now. Um, was lucky enough. I was one of the gentlemen, uh, myself and Annie McDonald started uh, Tesla's collision, collision repair program back in 2012. I uh, really didn't know what I was getting myself into. Um, and uh, really enjoy the EV startup world. This is actually, Rivian's my third startup um, that I've worked at, EV startup. So um, enjoy it. Tell everyone I'm just a, a glutton for punishment. Uh, it's not for everyone, but I, I definitely enjoy the challenges that come with working at a startup, um, walking into an environment that um, there's nothing set and everything is just open to interpretation on how you want to build something. So uh, thank you for having me and uh, I'll, uh, I'll pass it back to you. Cole, thank you. Awesome, man. No, appreciate that. Quite the background. And and if listeners recall, you and I go way back to your time on the equipment side of the industry as well. So uh, congratulations on the continued success, the new title. That is awesome. Uh, Chris Burton, can you share a little bit about your journey in the collision repair industry and how Roslyn Auto Body uh, became certified to repair EVs like Rivian, Tesla, and beyond? Yeah, for sure. So, um, I'm about 20, 22 years in full time, I guess now. Um, father's business, uh, he retired uh, in 2019, so I'm second generation. We are in Alexandria, Virginia, which is like a suburb right outside of Washington, D.C. Um, we are certified in uh, certain different makes. Um, it was a journey we started in 2015 um, with Tesla, and then we've evolved it from there. Fantastic. And I want to dive a little bit deeper because so much of what we talk about in the collision vision conversations are actionable rubber meets road stuff. And I want to talk to you a little bit about the experience around getting certifications for brands like Rivian, like Tesla. 
How can shops do that? What did that process at a high level look like? What were some of the ups and downs? Kind of just walk us through what shops can expect and how they can take advantage of programs like these. Well, I think you've got to come into it pretty like open-minded, right? So like, you know, um, facility wise, tooling wise, and then tech wise, right? So you really need to make sure your techs are on board and it's a different mindset for them. So just kind of, um, you know, introduce them and be supportive and, and show them the, the path and the way to, to move forward on these types of vehicles. Makes total sense. Kelly, from an OE's perspective, can you dive a little bit into kind of what you're looking for when you consider shops, both now at Rivian and, and in past lives as well? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, um, touched a little bit on, on, on Chris. Chris and I had known each other for years. Um, I think it was probably 2014. I walked into to, to Chris's business and was kind of pitching him the idea of becoming uh, certified uh, for, for Tesla. Um, you know, I think from, from my perspective and, and uh, Rivian's perspective, uh, our team, you know, we are looking for shops that first and foremost are just open to uh, growing with us, you know, looking at training requirements, tooling requirements. Um, you know, I talk to a lot of shops out there that, you know, oh, well, I'll, yeah, I'll work on your vehicles, but I don't want to do training. And, you know, I don't, I don't want to buy all these tools and things. And so, um, you know, we put these uh, standards in place from our perspective to make sure that every shop that gets a vehicle in their door is ready uh, to, to do the repairs. And so, um, you know, we, we try really hard uh, at Rivian not to have shops just buying unnecessary tooling. But the tooling that we do require, you need to have it to repair the vehicles. And so, you know, it, it never fails. You know, you say, okay, well, maybe you don't need to get that tool. The first vehicle that comes in their door, they're needing that. And so I think, you know, those are the things that we look at just walking into a shop, uh, having a shop that's open to a training environment. You know, like uh, there's a lot of shops we deal with that are just, you know, they really, really enjoy training. They want their techs training. The techs are engaged in training. Um, we also offer um, in our in our certified network. We we offer for an owner or a manager they can attend training uh, uh, as an observer, just so they can you know they're not doing the hands on work, but they can actually just get um, they can see what what goes into doing the repairs and what their technicians are doing. Very cool. I, I think the opportunity around certifications like these are are pretty evident. Uh, I I do want to dive into. Some of the stuff that you and I, Kelly, talked about in our previous conversation, maybe some of the, uh, call it less fun, but very important components of repairing EVs, and, and that primarily, from my perspective, centers around safety. What are some of the primary safety concerns when working on EVs, especially, you know, touching some of the things within these high voltage systems alone can be just a, a devastating mistake? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's something that is is critical when you look at um, EVs in general, right? Just making sure that you have the necessary skills and the information to be able to work on them safely. Um, you know, when we look at what's required, um, you know, high voltage gloves, um, even just the the uh, there's a tool out there to test uh, HV gloves that fills them full of air just to check for leaks um, because you can have a pinhole in in an hv glove and if you have a if you have a short in hv it can actually jump through that little tiny pinhole and so as crazy as that sounds right that's where the training comes into where you know see uh, evs are very safe to work around when you know what you're doing and and you know from from our perspective like having the entire shop understand that with um rivian we do have both on online training and instructor-led training uh, the instructor-led training, um, you know, we just ask for the technicians that are actually doing the work to go to these courses. But the online courses, we actually we really push the shops to have everybody in their in the building take the training because um, working around high voltage, if there's a vehicle that is has a battery pack out of the vehicle or uh, has um, you know the front end tore apart and there's and there's high voltage lines exposed, it's really good just to have everybody in the in the building uh, on the same page as far as safety. Um, again, you know, these are things that uh, when you look at high voltage safety, um, you can really look to, uh, you know, the, the electrical industry, just like in your house. And you look at like commercial wiring and things, a lot of the safety equipment and things that we utilize uh, working on EVs are actually found in 
in uh, these greater uh, industries. So definitely things that aren't necessarily really new. Uh, I think the biggest thing though, is making sure shops don't get complacent around high voltage. And, you know, it's just like electricity in your house, you know, you can't see it, it's not there, uh, but it's present at all times. So, you know, those are things that we really um, just push for uh, our shops to be aware of. And, um, you know, and, and they're not gonna get it. Uh, we, we have techs come in and do the instructor led training, basically to demonstrate to us that they understand, like they've read their repair procedures, they've done the online training. Now they, they're demonstrating to us that they actually know um, that uh, they know all the steps to, to properly uh, disable high voltage. Makes total sense. Now, Chris, you, you have multiple EV certifications, but you're, you're certification centric. You have multiple certifications of all sorts of types. So it's not something that's likely at front of mind day in and day out, but how do these EV safety considerations affect your shop's daily operations, the protocols you have in place for your technicians? Well, I think Kelly kind of nailed it earlier when he's talking about training, right? Like, so, you know, we, we really work hard to like create like a culture and environment where people like want to train, not because they have to, but because they want to, and they want to get better. And so they are always looking at, Hey, Hey, you know, I see this class online. Can you sign me up for this one? Hey, what's this class about? Hey, can you check into this? So, I mean, so it's really important for us to like, you know, push training and always be training. I mean, it, every single day there's somebody here doing some sort of training whether whatever oem it is or or, or a different you know icar class or this or that i mean it, every single day someone's doing training and that that's just kind of like it it constantly reinforces it right so i think once you if you don't take a lot of training classes then maybe you kind of get complacent or maybe kind of things just kind of slip out of your mind a little bit but once it's fresh on mind and once you're seeing it all the time you know it's, it's a lot easier for us to kind of push hey look guys this is where we're at and just kind of get everybody together on the same page so kind of culture focused as much as anything, make sure people kind of care about it. If they care about it and they want everyone to be safe, they're going to know about how to appropriately repair these vehicles. Uh, it makes total sense to me. I want to shift gears to a topic that Kelly, I told you in our pre-show call, I admittedly know very, very little about. So walk me through this with some, some kid gloves on, but battery system repairs. What are the key differences between repairing battery systems and EVs versus compared to just kind of the traditional internal combustion engine components we deal with uh, day in, day out for non-EV repairs? Yeah. Um, so the, the nice thing about EVs is they're much, much simpler um, from a, a part count perspective, right? There's a lot less moving parts, a lot less parts. When you look at uh, an internal combustion vehicle, right? You've got uh, the, the engine, um, you've got the coolant system, you've got the transmission, um, you've just, you've got all these different systems uh, of the vehicle. You got the fuel injection, the fuel system, um, lots of different systems, lots of parts, lots of things that long-term could potentially fail. When you look at an EV, um, much less parts, the, the, the drive unit is the engine and the transmission together. Uh, you've got inverters that take, um, you know, the, the AC power converts it to DC a lot of different um, electronics. And so I think when we look at the the, the differences, um, you know, even the inside of an HV battery pack, there's lots of pieces in there. Um, they're broke down, typically all manufacturers break them down in modules. And so, um, you know, batteries can have numerous modules in them with thousands of cells, uh, batteries, individual battery cells. The modules make it easier to assemble the battery. They assemble the modules uh, separately, uh, and then they put the, mo the the number of modules into a larger HV pack. You know, when you seen on a pack, um, especially in the collision world, we're not you're not going to be repairing an HV battery pack. You're you're going to be removing it potentially for a repair. Um, if you're going to be welding near it or anything like that, uh, on, uh, you're going to need to get it out of the way. Um, and it really depends on by OE. So, you, you know, reading the repair procedures from the specific manufacturer is going to be your key because, you know, some manufacturers uh, have inches, number of inches away that you can weld near a pack. And again, it's very specific by OE. But, you know, when you look at how you repair uh, an HV battery pack, um, it's going to be very clean, sterile environment. And so uh, nothing, when you look at 
packs today, if there's a problem with the pack, it's going to get removed, replaced with a new one, and that battery pack is going to get shipped somewhere to a location that is a very clean environment um, that has all the specialty tools. Uh, a lot of people may or may not realize that there's coolant flowing through all these battery cells. And so when you look at all the different pieces and, and how a battery pack goes together, there's a lot of different tools at a manuf manufacturing level that are not inexpensive and require lots of testing. So, you know, just even sealing a battery pack with, with Rivians on our R1T pickup and our R1S SUV, we, we advertise that you can drive through 36 inches of water. So our HV packs have to be watertight um, to when you're driving through, if you're driving through 36 inches of water. So those go through a number of testing, uh, pressure tests to make sure that the, the pack is completely sealed and, and um, you know, safe to, for that environment. And so, you know, that's something that um, I don't see today. Now in the future, as EVs become more mainstream, maybe you'll have HV repair center, uh, battery repair centers. Um, but today, you know, that's really going to be handled by the manufacturer. The, the, the shops will be just removing and replacing the pack or removing and, and, and reinstalling it for a repair. Understood. Makes, makes total sense. Chris, any exposure, like when, when, battery system issues come to mind is there any common repairs or involvement you have there day to day and then how do you go about handling those we really don't when it comes to like hv batteries i mean we pull you know like you know certain oes will allow us to remove their hv battery packs and you know we have different tables and stuff but um you know i mean there's sometimes like some of the the casing or some of the rails on there will crack and then so you kind of just refer back to their procedures and see if like that's something that's repairable or if it would call for a whole, you know, replacement of the battery. Um, a lot of times, like when it comes to that, we would just refer it back to like service or we would send photos like, you know, to the collision team saying, hey, this is what's going on just to give you all a heads up and then just kind of work it from there. Beautiful. And using that example, then, Kelly, what kind of resources does Rivian and your team have for when there are battery issues and, and offering guidance to shops? Yeah, absolutely. I've got a, a, a staff, a sport team dedicated to supporting our network. So um, say Chris has a, a battery pack that took some damage on the bottom of the pack. Now there is allowable damage to an HV battery pack, and that is going to be specific by OE, but there are certain, there could be a dent or uh, a scratch in a battery case that could be fine. It could be um, acceptable. The only way we're going to know that is, is we have uh, the shops reach out to us directly, take pictures um, if, if needed. If we need to send a technician out from our service center to actually inspect um, the battery, we will do that. Um, also, too, from from Rivian's perspective, we can do pressure checks. We can do different tests on the pack, even with it still in the vehicle to make sure that there was there's been nothing internally damaged. And so it, it is very case specific. And so when we uh when we do have battery damage we do have to ask the shops to reach out and then we then we engage with the shop the nice thing about the rivians is they were designed for off-roading we have uh we have a, a lot of underbody shields um the great thing is we don't see damage that often um but again we, we, it happens and as the the vehicles as you get more and more vehicles on the road it's uh it, it will the frequency will go up but um you know the good thing is these batteries are designed to to go off-roading so um they're they're uh, definitely can take a take a beating but uh we just really want to be involved and help make make the best decision for the the vehicle um you know whether it needs to be replaced or if the damage it has is, is fine to, to leave um as is a lot to know for sure and it's great to have the oe support but it's a great segue into talking about some training for ev repair chris i know you've been doing this for quite a while 2014 with tesla that's a pretty darn early adopter so might might those wounds uh, and, and and challenges of training may have healed by now i hope but kelly from an oe's perspective what kind of training programs does rivian offer for collision repair technicians specifically to help them be the best they can be with ev repair yeah so the the great thing with um with rivian and our network we have a, a very uh we have an online learning portal where uh uh, technicians, estimators, managers, people can log in and take um, a lot of different courses. And so, and then we also have instructor led courses. And so 
the online learning is really just to get uh, familiar. Um, we do have some very specific training, like uh, working around our 12 volt batteries, um, disconnection and, and uh, re-engaging them. Um, but also then you, you'll you come to physical instructor led training. And so today we have mechanical training, um, which really um, dives into how to properly drain coolant, how to use our diagnostic tool. So we, uh, our diagnostic tool at Rivian is called Ride. Um, it's actually web-based. So uh, the collision center has to, uh, has to bring a laptop and we have a, a cable that we just hook to the OBD2 port on our vehicle and connect to the laptop. Uh, and, and so we go through that. We, we teach the technicians how to remove the drive units um, and then remove the battery and put everything back together. So we basically disassemble a vehicle and put it back together and have it running by the end of the week. And, you know, the, again, this is allows the technicians to get hands on um, experience. You know, they may not be dropping a battery every day. They may not be dropping a drive unit, but like going through these steps and, and understanding like this is what it takes. I think one thing that, you know, we should also show in our course is how to purge coolant out of our systems. Um, you know, EVs, uh, I, I would say, you know, when you, it, it used to be really e easy to like change a radiator on a car and an ice vehicle. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you just add coolant, wait for the thermostat to open up and the air, uh, air kind of just um, pops out of the top of the radiator. Vehicles are not that simple anymore when you, when even, even ice vehicles, but with EVs, especially Rivians, we actually have coolant running through modules and, and certain modules in our vehicle. And so um, you want to make sure when you're, that you purge all of the air out of our uh, coolant system to avoid uh, air locks. And so airlocks into modules that are not inexpensive uh, can cause a lot of problems. And so, you know, these are things that um, we, uh, we really stress the importance of. The other instructor-led course we have is actually for ADOS calibrations. Um, we have uh, a course that covers both our R1 and our EDV and our uh, commercial vans. And so, you know, I, I realize ADOS is a huge buzzword in the industry and there's a, there's a lot of interest in it. And so, you know, we we bring people in and we physically go through the whole process of calibration, calibrating the vehicles. Also, we go through like what happens if it doesn't work, um, because it's always great when it works that first time or when it goes through and there's no issues, especially in training. It always works. And then you get out, get back, get to your shop and then you're trying to do training or sorry, excuse me, trying to do calibrations and realize, wait, it's not working. And so um, the, the great thing at Rivian, though, is I do also have a diagnostic team. So if you do have problems, you can also um, call in and get support from uh, from a diagnostic uh, perspective as well. Fantastic, man. I, I, I'm just envisioning the listeners of the Collision Vision. I think so many view EV repair as a huge opportunity. I'm sure there's a small subsector who are listening to this and like, oh, man, this is this is a whole new thing. The investment, the training, there's so much to know. Chris, talk to me going way back to 2014, 2015, you're getting onboarded and familiar with the world of, of EVs. How did you and your staff get trained to handle repairs of these EVs? Granted, the, the network was not anywhere near and the systems weren't anywhere near as developed as they are today. Yeah, it's definitely evolved. But if, if I could just go back to like, just say, you know, just uh, what Kelly was saying. So like, you know, Rivian as a, as an OE to work with, I mean, they're, super supportive right like so the instructor-led classes are you know some of the best that we've been to a lot of us have been to them i've been to them personally um all the online stuff and then even just having the ability to like email somebody and and actually get a response you know you know relatively quick and then you have like you, you have you know, each region has its own support manager so i mean ribbing as a company is very it's easy to work with right so it's refreshing and it's it's a partnership that uh it's something that you want to be a part of, right? Something that you want to grow with. But, um, you know, back 20, 2014, almost 10 years, I guess, 10 years ago now. Um, so, yeah, it's crazy. It's that quick, right? So, um, <laughs> yeah. Time flies. <laughs> especially when you're having fun. Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, it was a lot different back then. Um, you know, Tesla as a program was a lot different, but, I mean, it's evolved. Um, so, I mean, just EVs itself and... Um, you know, dealing with all aluminum bodied cars, you know, with it, with the SNX back then before three or Y it was just a, 
a lot different for us just trying to get into that. But I mean, it was an opportunity for us to kind of um, be on the forefront and especially in our region here in the DC area, there's, there's, you know, a lot of EVs on the road. So, I mean, it was really an opportunity for us to, to help our business grow too. I, I think it is. And just that huge opportunity is, is whenever I talk with Kelly or anybody in the EV world, I'm, I'm just losing my mind. Like, man, there's so many cool things happening yet. I understand the investment and the challenges that come along with that. Chris, if you're a put your shop owner, who's not in the EV world hat on. And if you're listening to this and you're like, oh man, I, I, I want to get into that world. What advice would you have to shop owners looking to kind of emulate what you and other EV centric folks have done? So I think, um, like when we're talking about tooling, right? Like tooling, so yeah, it, it's an upfront cost, but just be mindful that it's not the end of it, right? So it's a continuous cost. You know, certain welders only have a certain lifespan. Um, everything needs to be maintained all the time. Uh, stuff wears out, right? Like stuff breaks. So, I mean, you're, it's not a, it's not a one-time, hey, I bought, you know, all these tools and now I'm ready to rock. No, I mean, it's a continuous investment into tooling and it's a commitment to have the best tools and to be always be trying to get, you know, the, the stuff that's going to help your guys and, and help everybody in the shop do fix cars better. Um, training wise, um, it's constant and it's a lot and it's not just online stuff. And it's, it's, I mean, we spend a lot of money on training. I mean, we've like, I mean, we've got guys, one guy in Texas, and then one guy will be in California at the same time. And one guy will be in Georgia. I mean, it's, 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 you know, you're, you're booking several flights and hotels and rental cars and then, I mean, we, we travel now more than we ever have. And it's, it's, um, but it, it's also on the other side of that. It's also helped our shop a lot too, right? So we, we, we really are able to be, I don't want to say it on the cutting edge, but we're able to really know what's, what's in the know and what's going on with these cars and how to fix them properly. Um, I mean, the, the safety is the number one really, right? So like safety wise, everything you do, you just got to slow down. I mean, it's not about, you know, it's not about rushing. It's about really slowing down, taking your time, really focus on what you're doing. And then from there, it kind of evolves. Beautiful. Okay. Yeah. No, it, it knocked it out of the park there. And, and safety and ROI are kind of the two things that, that we'll harp on, right? Safety, number one, first and foremost, by far. And then that ROI, it is it is an investment, but it's one that it sounds like you and, and many others have seen a real return on making that investment into proper EV repairs. Kelly, same question, man. What, what advice would you give to shop owners looking to really explore the EV avenue? You know, I, you know, from my perspective, since I've been in the industry a long time, I, I was a former shop owner in my, my past a long time ago, is just really do your do your homework, investigate. Uh, I know Rivian, from our perspective, we do look at other OE programs and like welders and rivet guns and different things that people have. We don't try to go out and have obscure tooling that is that is mandatory. Um, we, we try to look at what, what other welders out there, you know, spot welders, for instance, we've te we have a number of spot welding spot welders uh, on our list that are approved. We actually did have to do physical engineering tests. So, um, you know, it was not, it was time intensive. It was not cheap. And we went through and, um, and tested a lot of different welders. And so if a well, a spot welder is not approved, if you have a welder that's not approved, uh, there's a reason why we probably tested and maybe it didn't pass or maybe it's so old to Chris's point earlier. Like, unfortunately, spot welders, they are not in, inexpensive. They're about 30 grand today, but they also do have a finite life. And so when you look at um, even some of the welders, spot welders today actually have counters on them. So you can actually see how many thousands of welds these things have welded on uh, out there, uh, vehicles, spot welds that they've welded. But, you know, as we evolve, um, and, and, you know, manufacturers stop making welders. And so we do continually work on when, a, when uh, one of our vendors, approved vendors reaches out and say, hey, we have a new uh, spot welder coming on the market. Can we do the testing? Absolutely. We want to make sure that those um, that that equipment is getting approved because the other OEMs are going to be jumping on board, too, especially with with um, with these these welders because they have a track work record um, with with their with other OEs. Excuse me. So I think those are things that we look at and. Right, Chris, it's not right. I know there's OEs that require tooling. And even for us, like Rivian, we we are a startup. We're moving really fast. 
Uh, we have we have some tooling that we all already had shops buy that guess what? We have new tooling now and that tooling kind of became obsolete. Wasn't intentional. We don't try to do that. Luckily that tooling wasn't that expensive. Um, but you know, these are the things that I'm sure people have been into. I think, I, I think about dealerships and like the service side a little bit more. When I think about like special tools, you can walk into a dealer into their special tool room and see hundreds of tools just sitting there that may or may not have been used. Right. And, and now they're obsolete and now there's new tools getting shipped. And so, from from our perspective, I think just doing doing your homework, looking at okay, which which programs am I interested in, and then look at this uh, the the tool crossovers. Look at like the investment too. I, I know Mark Allen from from Audi. Um, he's very vocal about the commitment to be uh, a certified facility for Audi. It is a big in, uh, time invest uh, investment and time money uh, technicians away from from the shop and from their families. Um, but also, right, those they're getting trained very well. You have a very uh, well-oiled machine when you get through that program. So, yeah, I think from from my perspective, it's just um, I, I was just having a conversation actually today with someone. It used to be easy to fix cars, right? It used to be so easy. You know, the you had a MIG welder. Uh, you know, everything was mild steel, no rivet guns. Like, hey, if you need to put a rivet, it was usually for to hold a bracket down for a, for something minor, right? Is now you have rivets that are holding the body structure together. So, you know, I think that is something that, to Chris's point, like shops just need to get used to. Like, there is going to be constant change here because our vehicles, the construction of, of vehicles, are so drastically different than they used to be, and like we can't fix keep fixing vehicles the way we always have been. The only constant is change in this world, I've come to learn and believe. And it's almost like, you know, a little something about welders. It, it's taking all I have to not yeah. try to talk more <laughs> welders. Uh, I, I, we've we've done a really good job. And thank you both. We, we've addressed a lot of uh, your backgrounds, both very, very compelling and, and a reason as to why we're having this conversation today. A lot of really good rubber meets road actionable advice for listeners and shop owners. I want to ask you both to pull out the crystal ball, though. I, I love pivoting to a forward-looking conversation, and, and I'm going to ask each of you a slight variation of, of, of the same question. But, Kelly, how do you see the rise of EVs shaping the future of the collision repair industry? I mean, there's definitely going to be more, uh, no doubt. Uh, is it is it uh is it going to be all EVs and, and ICE vehicles going to become extinct? I, I don't think so. That's I, and I don't think that'll happen in my lifetime, right? Like there's uh, there's a lot of advantages for EVs. Um, there's some disadvantages, but like from a from a repair perspective, right? There's still going to be ICE vehicles and there's still going to be EV vehicles. And um, the challenge is, I think, when you look forward, is because our vehicles are becoming more complex. And, you know, there's a lot of shops out there that have lots of certifications, right? And um, it may come to a point, and, and I don't, and 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 then that's the, the crystal ball, part of the crystal ball that's still a little bit fuzzy to me is, at what point does a shop go, you know what, I can't, I can't really, does it make sense financially for me to be in 10 certifications because I'm having to buy all these tools and I'm having to commit to all this training, maybe I should cut back and do less certifications but specialize a little bit more which is for me as a oe it gives me heartburn when i think about that but i but i also know like how what our demands are and what we have coming in the future is like we want to make sure that the shops are prepared and that may require them buying some equipment or additional training and so you know the, the industry as a whole, right, in the, in the U.S. market, right, the, the number always fluctuates, right? Do we have 36,000 shops? Do we have 33,000 um, shops? Whatever that number is. But when you start looking at um, shops having to choose what they want to work on, it only really dr drives even more opportunities. So I think from, from the perspective of um, opportunities in our industry, Right. When you really get good at some at repairing one vehicle or a particular brand of vehicle, you get, your whole shop gets comfortable. Your technicians get comfortable with how these vehicles are put together and how the repair procedures are laid out and how, how you write an accurate estimate. Um, it really it does help the, your overall business. And so um, 
you know, it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out. But I think that that uh, is kind of just some of the things I see coming down the road. Specialization, man. It's music to my ears. It's something you and I have discussed in the past at length. One other thing uh, before I get to that variation of Chris's question, too. Last we spoke, seemed like we were pretty far away from self-driving cars. Just checking in on a temperature read there. Do you feel the same? <laughs> Just want to make sure. <laughs> it, is, it is still a mad dash. It's still, there is a lot of money getting pumped into this segment, um, right? The vehicles are getting safer. Uh, you know, there there are less deaths in, our, in, in vehicles. Uh, you know, when we look at the amount of effort it goes into designing a vehicle and how safe they are, you're not, you know, the, the vehicles on the road today compared to even 10 years ago are, are light years ahead. And so, uh, you know, for, for self-driving, that's, uh, that's still a long ways off in my opinion. I think, um, I think the systems will get much continually getting better. It's, it's really, uh, interesting to see all the different variations out there today, but, uh, it's, it's still a lot of, it's a mad dash out there for that perspective. I just wanted to hit you while you still had the crystal ball out. Yeah. Make sure, uh, <laughs> yeah. Nothing I'm missing on a, a major level. Uh, Chris, what changes or trends do you anticipate over the next few years looking forward for collision repair uh, generally? Sorry, you froze out a little bit there. Yeah, I think you locked up. Oh. <laughs> Must have had a internet outage. That's actually a good. That's, that's actually a good picture right there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hands open. He's, he's open. Yep. Yep. So, he's he's ready for change. Hey, I lost you guys for a second. Sorry, I'm gonna yeah. note that. Uh, yeah, I was we'll gone. To, so where we'll where did uh, yeah. yeah where did I drop out? When you were about uh, ready to ask a question, I think. Okay, <laughs> perfect. So I'm noting 35 minutes. Uh, apologies. Looks like I'm back. So uh, yeah, let's see. What we're doing. I was about to type y'all an email. That was not fun. All right. I'll hurry it up. Maybe it's a Wi-Fi issue on my end, but uh, let's see. Starting at 36. Chris, on to your variation of that question. What changes or trends do you anticipate over the next few years for collision repair shops, both related to EV and, and just kind of general industry looking ahead? Um, general industry looking ahead, I would say, you know, we'll probably see like, you know, a continuation of consolidation, right? I, I, um, and that's, you know, a lot of different ways of that consolidation is going to be happening. It's... Um, more and more right in the market. And then as far as like EV wise, I think um, kind of like what Kelly said, I don't think it's going to go full blown. You know, we're all transitioning. You know, I, I think certain automakers and OEMs have changed their course. Um, it'll be a natural kind of like a slower kind of progression, maybe to hybrids for some. And then, you know, some will have that EV mix and then, you know, some won't go all the way. There'll be a lot of, you know, EV only brands. I kind of a, a mix of all of that for it, I think. Um, you know, the specialization thing. So like for us, I mean, we really only fix what we're, what we're certified in anymore. I mean, we have, you know, there'll be some, you know, you know, one or two offs here and there, but the majority of cars we fix are the ones that were certified. And it's, it's pretty much, you know, you know, five, six brands of cars that we repaired and we're, we've got it down pretty well to, to how to move forward with those. Um, you know, I do think, you know, it's getting into the, um, you know, the labor kind of like apprentices, you know, a lot of times the narrative is, is that there's not a lot of kids that want to get in the industry and there's not a lot of opportunities for them to, uh, for shops to hire kids. Um, you know, for us, honestly, it's actually been quite the opposite. You know, I've, I've got more apprentices now than we ever have. We've got, um, you know, what, five kids right now that are, you know, 18, 19, 20 years old. Um, you know, there's, if we had more space or more opportunities, we could, we could probably hire more. So I think the, the narrative that kids don't want to do this is incorrect. I think a lot of a lot of kids do want to do this, but they want to be in a place where they're supported and, and um, where they're free to learn and where, where where they can you know make mistakes and improve and grow. 
Man, that's so heartening to hear. And I have to credit those, certainly culture that you've built, but also I imagine the OEMs, the EVs, it's a, it's a, it's a sexier thing than, than traditionally how kids I think have viewed the industry, but that's so great to hear. Cause that's something, uh, no matter what the topic of conversation on the collision vision, at some point we touch on talent. There's really no bigger topic yeah. in the entire industry. Guys, you've both been so generous with your time, insightful in your thoughts, really appreciate it. I want to start the process of wrapping up as, as you know, we like to end each episode of the collision vision with three key takeaways. I'm going to ask for some bonus takeaways here because we have two of you. I'd like to go one by one. Kelly, we'll start with you. If, if you're a listener here and you're taking away three things from our conversation today, what is it? Uh, I would, from my perspective, just, you know, looking at your business, if you're looking at, you know, diversifying, getting into different things, looking at certifications, just kind of looking at all the different things you need to do. You know, most OEMs that I'm aware of will share the requirements and um kind of the background of what it takes to be certified uh you know and so that's you know if it's things that you're looking at interested in getting into it definitely makes it helpful to, to research it um before you actually do it because there's some there's some things that maybe doesn't make sense and and i talked to a lot of different collision centers across the country and uh you know even sometimes globally uh that right like they go you know we understand you know the program but to, it just doesn't fit our business model uh, especially when you look on the commercial side uh, the fleet side that we have at rivian that particular the, the reason we split programs was because we it didn't make sense for a lot of shops to try to fit a big 10 foot high van into their passenger vehicle paint booth because it wouldn't fit anyway and so i think just looking at um looking at what where you want to take your business uh in the future and looking at does do certifications make sense i think the sooner that you look start getting into some programs and there's obviously varying different types of oe programs right there's programs out there that um are not as strenuous and that's okay and then there's programs i mean i will say rivian we you know we have a lot of there's a lot of things to it there's there's standards there's tooling there's a lot of investment there's training commitments so you know, you can look at maybe dipping your toes into the water with with other programs um, if it makes sense for your business, um, or or you can just jump jump right in uh, like Chris has done in the past and 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 get involved with it. Uh, but yeah, I think those are things that um, are are uh, is is one takeaway. Awesome, Chris. What do you have for me in terms of takeaways? Well, just to to, to Kelly's point there, I I. I don't know how to say it nicely. I, I don't think every shop is is for certifications, right? Like, so I think you really need to like pick. You know, I don't think it fits every model, and I don't think every certification, every OEM, even fits our model, right? Like, so I mean, I don't think you can be everything to anybody anymore. Kind of like you know, 30, 40 years. I mean, specialization, right? Like, I think a lot of mechanical shops, like you had your, you know, this is a BMW only shop, or these guys only do, you know, Porsches or Porsches, and then. Um, I mean, we never really saw a lot of that in the collision space, but I do think it's kind of like evolving towards that for sure. Oh, no doubt. I, Kelly, uh, I feel like you sort of introduced that concept to me in into the mainstream with specialization. And uh, so many of the smartest operators in the business, present company included here with Chris, are buying that. And, and I, you know, double down on it. If you're listening to this show, these are some smart folks talking about some really impactful things. Kelly, where can people follow along, get in touch with your team at Rivian, learn how to get certified? Kind of where can you guide them? Yeah, so we actually do have an application uh, link. And uh, Cole, I can share that with you um, so we can get that out there. But we do have a, a real easy link you can click on. You can actually fill it out on your phone, uh, walk around your business, take a couple pictures uh, and, and apply in a matter of minutes. Uh, and what that does is that uh, we, we have a system that tracks applications uh, and then, you know, we look at it. I think some of the the challenges that we have at Rivian, right, was we're still growing. We're uh, a newer EV company. Uh, our car population has doubled over the last couple of years is, uh, and it continues to. So, um, you know, we have a lot of interest, which I appreciate everybody reaching out and the interest in our programs. But we also like talking about the level of investment of tools and training and everything. We 
we are very aware of what it takes to be in our program. We also want to make sure that uh, the shops in our programs uh, are successful. And so overloading the network with too many shops in, in markets can actually backfire where nobody's getting uh, a return on their investment. They're not, they're not seeing the vehicles um, in their shops for all the training and tooling that they've, they've invested in. And so, you know, for us, as we grow, uh, we will continue to grow the network every year. Uh, but also we, we do look at like, where are our vehicles are at? Where are our customers located? And, um, you know, we don't want, um, we, we want to give our customers opportunities and options, but it's a fine line because, um, you know, if there's, there's not a lot of vehicles in the market and we have a shop there, we have coverage. Right. Um, and, and so those are the things, some of the things that from my perspective, just we're, we will continue to grow. And sometimes we get shops that are frustrated. They really are excited. They want to be on the network. And, and we, I love to see that. We just want to make sure that uh, they understand too, right? Like if you, if you spent all this money and got brought onto the program and you didn't see any vehicles, like you'd be, then you'd be really, you'd be upset on, <laughs> on the other end of it. So, you know, we, we definitely stay engaged with shops that are interested. And, um, you know, I look forward to the future as we continue to grow and uh, you see Rivian vehicles everywhere out there on the road. Fantastic. All about responsible growth, taking care of your network and, and understood completely. Chris, where can people follow along with you and, and get in touch if they have any questions? Uh, they can just email me. So it's just uh, Chris, K-R-I-S at roslinautobody.com. Easy enough, man. I'll be sure to include that in the show notes as well. Chris Burton, Kelly Logan, really appreciate you guys joining us. Had a blast today. Thank you for joining us here on the Collision Vision. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Cole. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, guys. Thank you again to Kelly Logan of Rivian and Chris Burton of Roslyn Autobody for their insights around the world of EV repair. Some recurring high-level themes. Safety is so important, and it's a different game and a different level when discussing EVs. Return on investment is also key. Yes, there is a cost to getting certified that takes both time and money. The question is, is the cost worth it to you to get a great return? Lastly, specialization. That's something both Kelly and Chris spent a ton of time on. If you want to make sure an OE certification offers you a good ROI, especially one for EVs, consider specializing. If the market's right, if your talent's right, and I've made my feelings on the topic pretty clear as well. If you enjoyed our series on technology here on the Collision Vision, I got some exciting news for you. Next up is another series that I am extremely excited about, and I think you will be too. It's titled The MSO Chronicles, and each episode is going to feature an MSO executive from some of the largest organizations in the industry, as well as some of the industry's brightest up-and-comers, some visionaries, some great operators here. You are not going to want to miss this series. Come join us and learn from the greats here on the Collision Visions MSO Chronicles beginning next week. That is all for today's episode of the Collision Vision. If you enjoy it, please hit that follow button, leave us a review, and share us with your network wherever you get your podcast or on YouTube where the Collision Vision lives in video form. As always, on behalf of the Autobody News team and myself, thank you for coming along for the ride. Mm -hmm.